Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Let me just say a formal welcome now to all of you. Just really, I'm very personally very pleased. As I, as I said, this is my first opportunity in 18 months to really greet people and welcome them back into the building. I'm so pleased that we can do this. And the very first is to welcome the Tantia from Ireland, uh, Leo Radiker. Uh, uh, and I, um, it's, it's fitting and very appropriate uh, that he would be the first one that we can greet. Uh, because Ireland has always been first in many people's hearts here in the United States. We have such a strong bond. Uh, and it's, uh, so when all of the issues like Brexit came up and, and the Tansha was quite instrumental, as you all know, in seeing Ireland through that very difficult period, that was the one thing America was firmly in. We're not going to let Brexit undermine, you know, the, the peace accords. And that was, he was instrumental to make sure that that wouldn't be the case. And uh, so many other ways that his leadership was crucial during the time and during his, uh, during his earlier tenure when he was the Taoiseach. Um, he took Ireland's economy to heights and uh, that's coming back. That'll be coming back, we know, uh, because we know he's coming back. He's, uh, because of the agreement in the, uh, in the parliament, he will be returning as the Taoiseach uh, I think next year or late, late this year. So we, uh, we're going to have an opportunity not only to hear, um, hear, uh, hear his perspective today on Ireland, but we're also going to get a little bit of an insight into where Ireland is going to go because rarely do we know who's going to be the prime minister a year from now, but we do here. And so it's a real privilege that, we're, that we have him here today. We're, what we're going to do is, is uh, is the Tansha is going to come up and offer some preliminary remarks, and then we will turn it over to uh, my colleagues, Heather Conley and Bill Reinch, who are going to engage in a, in a dialogue, and hopefully we'll bring all of you into it. So even though the, the volume of the applause is not going to be high, our enthusiasm is not diminished, would you please, with your warm applause, welcome the Tansha from Ireland, His Excellency Leo Vradiker. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and uh, and good morning, everyone. And I have to say, it's a real uh, pleasure to the opportunity to speak with you today uh, on what is my first visit um, back to the U.S. since the pandemic began. And it is it is great to be here. Um, I I love America. There would rarely have been a year that I didn't have a chance to visit at least once, if not twice. Uh, and it is um, it is great to be back here again. And we'd love to see Americans uh, in Ireland again, uh, by the way. Uh, so I know that the travel restrictions are ending in November. Um, and uh, as far as Ireland is concerned, uh, the rules that we apply is that anyone who's uh, fully vaccinated uh, is free to enter the country um, without, a, without the need for a test. Uh, so hopefully we will see uh, a return to um, both business and leisure travel uh, in the coming months. And would love to see you uh, in Ireland in the next few months, if not next year. Uh, it has been a very long 18 months, as you know, um, but it is really uh, great to be able to speak with people in person again um, when we spent so much time apart. And it is an honor to be one of uh, your first guests uh, to um, address people uh, in public, as well as, of course, uh, being joined online by others. Uh, let me start uh, at the outset to, by acknowledging the work of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, our host today. I think COVID-19 has demonstrated the value and importance of research and expertise, and your insight will be invaluable as we navigate our way out of the pandemic. And it is a pandemic that demonstrates once again uh, the extent to which so many of the problems that we face transcend national borders uh, and are international in origin and therefore require international solutions. That's true of the pandemic, it's true of climate change, and it's true of many of the uh, strategic challenges that we face. 
So to begin with COVID, it was on my first trip to Washington DC, or rather my last trip to Washington DC, that the scale of the pandemic was becoming apparent. And that was back in March 2019. I was traveling here for the traditional St. Patrick's Day events uh, when the uh, Irish Taoiseach and ministers travel the world uh, to visit our, um, our allies. Uh, and on that day, um, met with the president. Remember, it was on that day that he announced that flights uh, from Europe were going to stop. Uh, also met congressional leaders. And it was indeed that evening uh, that news was filtering through that we in Ireland, or our health experts in Ireland, uh, were recommending that we should take drastic action. Uh, to slow the virus uh, and to stop it in its tracks. A lot has happened since then, and very sadly, a lot of lives have been lost, um, both here uh, and in Ireland and in Europe. And I don't think there's anyone in this room who's left untouched. I think everybody knows somebody uh, who has passed away as a consequence of COVID, or at least somebody uh, who has been uh, ill as a consequence of COVID. Uh, economically, for employers and workers, it's been an exceptionally challenging time. Uh, in Ireland, we took a decision very early on uh, to try and save as many jobs and businesses as possible, and we introduced uh, unprecedented financial interventions and supports to do so. Uh, for example, we introduced a €350 Euro a week payment uh, for any worker that was laid off uh, as a consequence of uh, the pandemic. Uh, we introduced uh, work subsidies to help employers keep people on, a reduced sale tax, sales tax, uh, gave a weekly cash grant uh, to any business that was closed, uh, introduced low-cost loans, debt warehousing, and enhanced illness benefit for workers who were told they had to isolate or restrict their movements as a consequence of COVID, uh, and also brought in a, commercially, a commercial property tax waiver. Uh, these actions, as you can imagine, have placed considerable demands on our national finances. Uh, we've borrowed something in the region of 40 billion euros, which is small money for the American government, but big money for an Irish government, I can guarantee you, uh, in order to soften the blow of the pandemic. Um, but I'm sure uh, that it was the right thing to do. And as a consequence of that, we will bounce back quickly uh, and be able to service and pay down that debt. Uh, so over the next couple of months, we're uh, phasing, out, um, those we're phasing out those financial supports uh, as we phase out the restrictions. Uh, and as we reopen businesses and allow them to get back on their feet. Uh, as things stand in Ireland, uh, over 90% of adults, um, in fact, 90% of people over 16 uh, are fully vaccinated. And we're now moving on to vaccinating teenagers and giving that third dose uh, to people who need them. Uh, and as a consequence of that, even though the incidence of the virus is not low, um, the numbers in hospital and the numbers dying, thankfully, uh, is stable uh, and relatively low. Uh, and it's our intention on the 22nd of October to uh, end pretty much all remaining legal restrictions um, um, uh, as, a, uh, as a consequence of COVID. Uh, and uh, while this virus has surprised us on a few times in the past, things do look good and it looks like we'll be able to do that on October 22nd. Um, not going back to the old normal, um, but a new normal that isn't all that different from the old normal. Uh, the only restrictions really will be the requirement to wear a mask. Uh, in retail settings, uh, healthcare settings, and on public transport, uh, and of course the requirement to isolate yourself and get a test if you're sick. But really everything else uh, will be open on October 22nd, and I think it's fair to say that we're all uh, very much um, looking forward to that. Uh, thankfully, uh, pre-COVID, we entered the pandemic in good shape financially. Uh, we had a small budget surplus, uh, a growing economy, and we're close to full employment. Furthermore, throughout the pandemic, and indeed uh, after our last recession, our export-led traded sector proved to be extremely resilient, uh, many of which uh, are US companies based in Ireland, in the tech sector, digital, uh, and, and pharmaceuticals, and medical devices as well. Uh, so tax receipts in Ireland held up very well, uh, even though unemployment rose, allowing us to intervene decisively in the way that we did. And while Ireland is widely known as a significant European hub for US foreign direct investment, investment flows across the, across, across the Atlantic, as we know, uh, are not all one way. The United States has always been a really important market for Irish companies. And today, almost 1,000 companies of Irish origin employ 110,000 people in all the US states. This makes Ireland the, the ninth largest source of foreign direct investment into the United States. And I think that's a remarkable achievement for a country and, a, and an economy, approximately 1 70th the size of the US. Uh, so I'm really glad to see that Irish companies in the US have shown great resilience to the challenges 
of COVID-19. Ireland is a fantastic place to do business, and we have four strengths that I believe set us apart from many of our competitors. First of all, we have a very young, well-educated workforce, and we are investing in education and lifelong learning all, all the time uh, to build on that. We are very competitive, which is underpinned by an attractive business environment. We are very connected, with 70 million people claiming Irish descent around the world. And we have a truly international workforce. Uh, we have the advantage, um, almost unique advantage at this stage, of being part of the EU's single labour market, as well as the United Kingdom's. And we have a position at the heart of Europe, its single market and Eurozone. Uh, so we have an economic plan in place, which will allow us to build back better than before, to get our people back to work, and also to seize the new opportunities that arise from the post-pandemic economy. I hope that Ireland will continue to be a fruitful partner for the many US businesses who choose us as their second home. On Brexit, the EU-UK Trade Cooperation Agreement, or TCA, and the Withdrawal Agreement, including the Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, have ensured that we have avoided the worst of what Brexit could have wrought on us. Brexit is not a policy that we advocated. It's not something that we ever wanted, though we do respect our neighbour's decision to leave. The Northern Ireland Protocol is the joint EU-UK solution to mitigate the disruption that Brexit has caused for citizens and businesses on the island of Ireland and, indeed, in the United Kingdom. We continue to advocate for a calm, responsible, joint EU-UK approach to the implementation of the Protocol. The Protocol's primary objective was to ensure that there would be no hard border between North and South, and that has been achieved. If you go to the border today, it looks no different than it did four or five years ago before the Brexit referendum. And indeed, trade flows between North and South have increased considerably in both directions, uh, thus helping to strengthen the all-island economy. Crucially, the European single market has been protected, something that was essential for us and also our EU allies. But there has been disruption in the flow of goods from Britain to Northern Ireland, more so than many of us anticipated, and that has caused problems that we wish to resolve. So the Irish Government welcomes the continuation of technical talks between the two sides. We strongly encourage the United Kingdom to work in partnership with the EU in order to identify pragmatic solutions and sustainable solutions to the outstanding issues around the implementation of the protocol. However, we are clear that the protocol is an international agreement. It has been agreed and cannot be renegotiated from scratch. Our approach, which is shared by our EU colleagues, continues to be informed by engagements with people and businesses in Northern Ireland, taking on board their genuine concerns as we seek to find realistic solutions. We are confident those, that those solutions do exist within the parameters of the protocol for the issues that have arisen to date. And I have to say once again, we greatly appreciate the steadfast US understanding and support for Ireland as we navigate our way through Brexit, a decision we regret but accept. Away from COVID and Brexit, I might highlight once again that Ireland is one of the world's most open export-based economies, with trade being a critical factor in our economic success. Our attractiveness is a place to invest, and our ability to enter into and honour international free trade agreements with other countries is the foundation of our economic model. With no oil, gas, diamonds or colonies, what we've had to do consistently to raise our living standards is to build our wealth on the goods and services we produce and sell abroad. In recent years and pre-COVID, the opportunities that international trade offers has been challenged by disruptive geopolitical, technological and financial forces that could have implications for the US and Ireland alike. The loss of some traditional employment on the one hand and skills challenges on the other, digitalization and the need to decarbonize and focus on sustainability are challenges that all countries who advocate for free trade must consider. 
as some more traditional industries no longer are able to support significant levels of employment, we must invest in new opportunities in the industries of the 21st century, including services and sustainable manufacturing. These are the challenges for both Ireland and the US, and I see your Build Back Better agenda fully recognises this in setting out the United States' roadmap for recovery. And with the EU and the US as leading first world economies, I believe we have a joint responsibility to shape the international trade policy agenda so that it works for citizens, employees, businesses, and more broadly for society. We also have responsibility towards our trade partners and producers and workers in third countries, especially those that are less developed economically. We believe that such openness also means that others, such as US businesses and entrepreneurs, should continue to see the EU as an honest and reliable partner, one that is fair, consistent and predictable in developing its trades policies, yet firm and committed when it comes to defending human rights and expectations of its economic operators, and holding our partners to honouring their commitments across the bilateral and multilateral trade agenda. We have witnessed across the globe in recent times, exacerbated by the pandemic, calls for the reshoring of manufacturing and the shortening of supply chains. These populist calls do not, in our view, bear up to proper economic scrutiny. More appropriate responses should be rooted in a twin-track approach of strengthening and diversifying supply chains while acknowledging the appropriateness of strategic stockpiling of emergency goods. Our international trade policies must, must be reviewed, naturally, but we must not create new vulnerabilities, increase costs and stifle innovation by taking short-term knee-jerk actions that are not in the strategic long-term interests of economic progress and development. The multilateral trade agenda continues to be of real importance for Ireland. The World Trade Organization is the central rule maker for international trade, making it easier for value chains to expand and economies to benefit from comparative advantage and specialisation. It also plays a vital role in helping less advantaged countries to gain from trade and profit from growing connections with international markets. The WTO is imperfect all international organisations are, and there are many valid criticisms of it, and I know many of these come from the US. For Ireland, we continue to see the need for an open, fair, rules-based international trading system, which stands up to protectionism, ensures a fair environment for all businesses to operate in, and creates prosperity by opening up markets worldwide. So while the WTO is currently threatened, I say we need to stand up for it, businesses as well as political leaders, while promoting and ensuring that it reforms. Tariffs, while attractive in the short run, ultimately target the consumer, increase prices and reduce choice. Tariffs generally protect inefficient industries and delay reform and restructuring, ultimately at the expense of wider society. They also run, run counter to the law of comparative advantage, which recognises that specialisation is more efficient and promotes innovation. So I would strongly argue that new tariffs and increased tariffs are not the answer to a transforming global economy. Rather, multilateral negotiations and agreements is the best and well-worn road to travel. So I have to say I very much welcome the fact that the EU and the US are now fully engaged on resolving outstanding current trade irritants in the civil aviation dispute, and hopefully in the coming weeks on the steel and aluminum dispute as well. So to conclude, post-Brexit with a new administration here in DC, we have a real opportunity to reforge the Atlantic alliance between Europe and the US, one that has been so successful in political terms, economic terms, and strategic terms an alliance which is a force for good, for stability, security and prosperity in the world. Ireland wants to be part of that alliance and indeed 
abridging that alliance. Through our EU membership, we're working closely with our EU colleagues to progress stronger trade relations and a renewed political and security partnership with the United States. And if the past 18 months have taught us anything, it is no challenge is insurmountable in the face of our collective spirit and ingenuity. We can employ those same traits to rebuild now a more just society and a thriving economy for both our countries. So thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Uh, when Heather and I have, have finished our interrogation, uh, we're going to have time for questions, and we'll begin with questions from the live audience. So get back in practice. We will have a microphone wandering around, and you actually can do something that you probably haven't done for 18 months, which is stand up and say who you are and ask a question. Uh, we will also have time for questions from our online audience, and I think that uh, those that uh, RSVP'd got an had instructions about what to do if you uh, want to submit a question, and they'll be uh, written down here and handed over to me, and I'll ask your questions. So that's the plan, uh, and I think what uh, Heather and I have done is divide up the workload a little bit. Heather's going to ask the, the large, cosmic, important questions that will capture the news cosmic. headlines, and I'm going to ask the weedy trade and economic questions that no one will pay attention to tomorrow. So Heather, why don't we start with you? Well, uh, thank you, Bill, and it is fantastic to, uh, to do this in person, and thank you so much for, for your remarks. Uh, I think it's only fitting. You closed the transatlantic mm. door, and now you're reopening it, so you are our perfect bookends to, to, to open. So our dear colleague, uh, Bob Schieffer, always says, let's start with the news. So I, 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 you're not getting off the Brexit hook. We're going to dive deeply into the protocol and the TCA. But as I was preparing for this conversation over the weekend, I was also preparing uh, to you know, observe closely the German election outcome. And today, uh, the Chancellor Merkel is now an official caretaker government mm -hmm. status. And so I thought I'd just start with the news. You sat around the European Council table with Chancellor Merkel. Um, what does her legacy mean uh, to, for Europe and your, any personal reflections you may have on, on her legacy and this future new coalition government that uh, is going to take a while to form. I just thought I'd yeah. have to ask you the news first, and then we'll, we'll dive into the subject matter. Yeah, well, I, I suppose, well, first of all, I, sh I should say that the, the, door, the doors between the US and, and uh, Ireland and the EU are, are definitely now open, uh, and really good to hear up here about, about the news about the travel restrictions being dropped, dropped in November. We, we dropped ours a, uh, a few months ago now, back in July, I think it was. And uh, Anthony Fauci was actually on Irish radio on, on Saturday um, on one of the most listened to radio shows uh, to make the point that it was safe for Irish people to travel here and vice versa. So uh, hopefully... Thank you um, for that advertisement. <laughs> yeah, obviously be careful and take all the necessary precautions, but, um, but it's uh, particularly for fully vaccinated people traveling again, we're, we're confident that the public health data um, says that that's safe to do. And it does reopen the possibility, I think, of, of necessary business travel, um, which I hope, um, hope will resume uh, over the next little while. Because um, as I said earlier, there, there are uh, 100,000 Americans employed in, in Irish-owned companies here, and those Irish owners haven't seen their companies, and vice versa, so hopefully we'll get back to that um, soon. But having digressed, to answer your question, um, yeah, so, so well, I, I think the nature, the nature of the European political systems, including in Ireland, uh, is it'll be many months before uh, a coalition is formed. So I, I, think, I think the Merkel caretaker government could well be around uh, until Christmas or, or into the new year. Um, uh, and as I learned, leading a uh, caretaker government during a pandemic, um, caretaker governments have full constitutional authority to govern. Uh, so um, I, I believe she'll be around for a little while yet. Um, I have to say, you know, she's somebody who I, I found to be a, a really strong ally. Um, the CDU is our, is our sister party, so we had a relationship at, at party level as, as well as in, intergovernment level. Um, but I think one thing that is very strong about the German political system is 
Um, it, it's, it's rarely personality based. Um, you know, the, the chancellor is not directly elected in the way the US president is. Um, uh, and um, that means you often have politicians who, 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 who are, are sort of good at focusing on detail and compromise and solutions, and she was very much in, in that space. Um, and also, it's, it's, it's a federal state. Uh, and particularly during Brexit, she had a particular understanding um, that small states matter, because in the German system, it isn't all about Bavaria or, or Niedersachsen, like Sar Saarland matters, and, and uh, you know, Schleswig-Holstein and all those small states really matter too. Uh, and I definitely think there were, at various points in time, uh, some people in London who were strong advocates of Brexit, who thought the big countries could just meet someday and sort it out. You know, like would have been the case in the 18th and 19th century. Um, you know, Paris, Berlin, London, and maybe Rome would uh, meet and, and sort it out. Um, and sh that was never going to happen while, while she was there because uh, she understood the importance of, of respecting small states in, in a sort of federal or confederal system. Uh, and that was crucial. But I think that will actually carry through to any future German, German chancellor uh, because, of, because of that system that they understand so well. Well, we, uh, you're great. I think we'll see you for a while. And uh, her details and step-by-step -step approach mm. was, was certainly essential. All right, I'll come back. But Bill, I'll turn but it over one, to you. One oh, final thing that I would say about that, though, is, is like, <laughs> as is often the case, um, you know, politicians are, are caricatured. And I'm not sure about here, but in Ireland, she was a little bit caricatured as being, as being kind of stern, you know, or very serious, as, as Germans often are caricatured as. But that's not the woman that I knew. She was very warm uh, and very chatty and uh, even a bit gossipy after meetings and so on. And uh, like a very normal down to earth person. And uh, I just hope she's a, a, a great life post politics. We are looking forward to hearing more about her post, her encore <laughs> career after Chancellor. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bill. Now you can dig down into the trade. Well, <laughs> I noticed they've, they've sold out a teddy bear that looks like her. So that yeah. may have something to do with softening her image. Yes, it's got the hair and <laughs> and the, the hands and the, uh, the, the symbol that she uses a lot. Uh, I want to turn to an issue where, uh, 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 an economic issue where Ireland's been in the forefront of the debate, and that's the global minimum tax. Mm. Uh, and I believe uh, uh, your government has said that it, it wants to be in the tent on a global minimum tax. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what that means, mm. what are your problems, and what would it take you to get, take to get you to sign up to the OECD deal? Mm. Oh, you don't expect me to answer that question. Of course we do. <laughs> at least, I, I'm we'd never like you to make some news. At, at least, That's at least, what we would like. Least not bluntly or overtly. I suppose I, 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 answer, I can try and answer it in a number of ways. I, I think, first of all, you know, the position that the Irish government takes, and a lot of countries in Europe take, and I think the US would take as well, uh, is, is that setting tax rates is a sovereign issue. You know, ultimately, you know, we decide what our income tax rate is, what our corporate tax rate is, um, what our capital gains tax rate is, and we'd be, we'd be very loath to um, depart from that principle that this is a sovereign decision for, for any, any government, and that's why we uh, retain the option of not participating in any uh, international agreement or any European directive on it. Um, but that's not our preference. Uh, we would rather be in the tent, as you said, um, both politically and, and economically. It would make more sense for us to be uh, inside any global framework, and it's it's in our nature to be inside global frameworks. It's it's our instinct, and that's where we, that's where where we want to be. Um, but one thing that has worked very well for us in, in our system is to have this um, low corporation tax rate. But it's not just the rate; it's the reliability. So uh, you know, through boom and bust, through recession, through periods of growth, through changes of government, uh, that rate has remained the same and low. So if you're making a 30 or 40 year investment in Ireland, you know, you know what the rules are. Uh, and that's why we'd um, want to keep it low and keep it constant. Um, and you know, among the things that we would be concerned about is this idea that it would be uh, at least 15% because um, it might then go higher. So you know, at any rate, we would want to know that it is the rate and it'll stay at the rate and won't change in five years time or 10 years time. Um, we'd certainly need to be assured that it would actually be implemented uh, by all of the countries signing up to it. Um, uh, obviously, anything like that would have to go through US Congress. It would have to go through the European Parliament and National Parliament. So we need to know that uh, everyone was doing it, and some countries didn't end up uh, adopting it. But you wouldn't didn't. be bothered if, if the United States, is, the President's proposed 21%. That wouldn't bother you, would it? 
if we went to 21? Well, well, it would. I mean, war, <laughs> yeah. war is not, does not complicate your life, I don't think. Is that to say it again? A uh, higher tax rate elsewhere does not complicate Ireland's life, does it? Uh, well, the, 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 the rate that other countries choose is, 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 is their business, and yeah, like a higher rate here doesn't, doesn't necessarily affect us, but what would affect us is what the administration might do with guilty. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and we would need to see where, where that might be set. I think it's now at maybe 10.5 or something. Um, so That's th what they're talking about, yeah, increasing. Yeah, but so it's that, that, would, that would have an impact on us. Um, but we totally respect the, the right of the U.S. to make that decision. Let me uh, move on to the digital question, and, uh, too, and then I'll turn it back to, uh, to Heather for uh, some more. Um, how is, uh, has your government uh, taken a view on the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services mm -hmm. Act? Do you support them? Do you want to see changes? Yeah, we're, 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 we're broadly supportive of the current package. It's, it's under negotiation, as, as you know, at European level at the moment. Um, and it's really designed to do two things. You know, it's designed to respect privacy, designed to um, uh, make sure that, that, that harmful online content is better regulated and removed uh, because of some of the um, you know, terrible things that, that are really, really happening in the social media space at the moment. And it's also designed to make sure that those very big, large platforms um, uh, don't don't become monopolistic or don't abuse abuse their market position. So, uh, the intentions are good um, behind it, and we're broadly supportive of where we are uh, at the moment with, with the compromise. But um, but it's very much something that we want uh, to have a watching brief on because um, you know the future is digital, uh, and um, that's increasingly going to be the case, so we don't want to stifle change or innovation, um, but we do want to make sure that um, platforms don't wield excessive power and that people's privacy is protected and that harmful content can be removed. There's concern here that uh, these bills are really targeted at large American companies like Google, Amazon, and the GAFA companies. Mm. Uh, do you believe that? Is that the intent? I, 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 I don't think that's going to be the outcome. Um, I, I believe there are some people who would who would like to use uh, these tools uh, for that purpose, not, not in Ireland, but perhaps uh, uh, in, in in other places. Um, um, and there is there's a feeling in, in some parts of Europe uh, that um, America is so far ahead of us uh, on on tech and on digital um, that the best way to fix that to enable Europe to catch up. Uh, is to kind of blunt or stunt the U.S. corporations. Um, that's not my approach to it, and it's not the Irish government's approach to it. Um, you know, we don't think that you achieve uh, in innovation and you drive technological development by, um, you know, protectionistic measures. Uh, so, it's it's it's. Uh, so I suppose you know there there are those different different elements in this debate at the moment. But certainly, we would envisage an outcome that. Um, just make sure that people have fair access to platforms, um, that there is more open access, uh, and, um, and that we do improve the situation in relation to privacy and harmful content in particular. Well, it's true that kneecapping the competition is a time-honored tactic, mm. but uh, not one that we, yeah, not one that we're excited yeah, about either. It doesn't, so it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't make you better, put it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, so. you have uh, uh, exceptional influence, I think, on this whole process because the uh, Ireland's Data Protection Commission has mm. a it really has, is responsible for a lot of the initial uh, judgments on these things since so many of these companies are headquartered in mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, how do you uh, reckon, or do you have any difficulty reconciling your position as a desirable location for the same large high-tech firms we're talking about at the same time that you're a leader in enforcing digital regulation? Yeah, well, I, I, I'd, I'd hope being, you know, providers of, of good regulation can become part of our um, offering uh, and will be one of the things that make us uh, competitive. You know, it's, it's never been the case that we um, encourage people to invest in Ireland on the basis that we'd poor regulation or, or light touch regulation. We want to have a good regulation um, and our regulator is, in, is independent of government uh, and very much acts independently uh, and is often criticized from both sides, um, you know, for doing too much uh, or not doing enough. and. Um, often when you're a good regulator, that's probably the right space to be in. Uh, one thing we are doing, which I think is really important and have done over the years, is, is really um, developing the capacity uh, of, of the regulator um, 
you know, because we are a small country, but we're huge when it comes to, to tech, that we need to make sure that that office is, is well resourced and properly resourced, and that, that's very much what we're doing. Heather, back to you. I'm going to swing you from the technology to the technical implementation of the Northern Protocol. Mm. Um, you had said, I believe it was an interview some time ago, that the protocol, the Northern Ireland Protocol, was a means to an end. So I want to talk about the end game a little bit. Um, the European Union, I think, has remained quite calm uh, in the face of some voices from London demanding a renegotiation of the protocol. Your remarks were very clear. This will occur within the protocol, um, but flexibility will, will be had. The e European Union is going to put forward a package, so sort of that um, what we would call best and final offer, perhaps, of, of the, the, the flexibility within the Northern Ireland Protocol. Are you positive or encouraged that uh, the British government will accept that? Uh, or are we going to head into something much messier, potentially at the end of the year, um, should the UK not accept those offerings, whatever they are, um, that this may require Brussels to actually begin to punish for lack of implementation? Help us understand where you think this is going. Yeah, well, I, 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 I definitely think that the European Commission and Mara Sefcovic, who's, who's leading, leading on this for the European Commission, um, uh, is taking a very reasonable approach. Um, he's made the point of going to Northern Ireland on several occasions, you know, really meeting with the business community, um, trying to find out what the problems are and what they're not. Uh, some of the problems that are happening in terms of supply chain uh, are not just happening in Northern Ireland. You know, there are some minor issues around supply chain in the Republic of Ireland. Protocol doesn't apply to us. but. They're happening anyway because of COVID and because of Brexit, and we can see in England real difficulties uh, because they've left the single market, uh, because they've left the single labour market. Um, you know, gas stations closed, uh, concerns about products getting to them by Christmas. Um, um, my sister lives in London, sent me pictures of em empty shelves in, the, in, in, in a supermarket in London. She's not the kind of person who would regularly do that type of thing or, or, or overreact to things. So you know, there are real supply problems now in England. Um, that is not because the protocol. The protocol doesn't apply to England. Um, it only applies to Northern Ireland. So I think some of the difficulties that uh, are being experienced in Northern Ireland uh, are, are less about the protocol and more about um, COVID and Brexit. But they're all getting wrapped into, into one and, and the protocol is being blamed. Um, but in terms of being a means to an end, um, you know, the, the end was no hard border between North and South. So it's worked in that regard. Um, we'd have to make sure that any changes or any um, flexibilities don't undermine that fact that there are no checks between North and South. And it's good to see North-South trade uh, increasing and increasing substantially. Uh, the, the second is that the European single market is, is not undermined. Um, and that's crucial for us. We, we can't see Ireland's place in the European single market being undermined as a consequence of, of Brexit. Um, but the third, and I think this is the area that we need to work on, uh, is we try to design the protocol in such a way uh, that Northern Ireland would have the advantage of largely unrestricted trade, both with the European Union and with Great Britain. Um, and it is the case that some of the checks and controls that have been imposed on trade from Britain into Northern Ireland ha have caused difficulties. Um, and you know we don't want that to be the case. Uh, and I think it's very important that uh, the European Union and the UK work together to be as flexible as that as as they can be. You know, if we can be assured that. Uh, you know, certain goods entering Britain from uh, entering Britain into Northern Ireland aren't going to come south, aren't going to come into single market. Then we wouldn't have a difficulty with that. So, you know, there are issues that I think, I think, need to be resolved, and I think we need to be sensitive to the concerns of the unionist community in Northern Ireland um, that any restrictions on trade between Britain and Northern Ireland to them feel like a diminution uh, of their place in the United Kingdom, uh, even though uh, you know trade in itself is is not a constitutional issue. Uh, many of them feel that it is, and we have to be sensitive to that and wise to that uh, and try and resolve um, problems as best we can. I think the one thing that, that concerns all of us, I'm sure uh, you uh, and others, is the, the threats, if I may put it that way, um, that uh, London will use Article 16, mm. the special measures which would be stopping, and that would challenge the mm. north-south border for sure. 
Um, over the weekend, we had Commissioner McGinnis, you know, saying that these kinds of conversations aren't aren't helpful. Uh, you know, one of the spokesperson from your party was saying that we're we're sort of tiring of this routine. Uh, that we, you know, the threat of using Article 16. Are, are, is the government making contingency plans? Should there be just a failure of working through this flexibility of the protocol? Or, or at this point, you're full confident that we will find, the EU and the UK will find a way through this? Well, well, we always have contingency plans, and it would be irresponsible for any government not to have contingency plans, even for unlikely outcomes. So, you know, we, we've had them uh, really from the early days after the referendum have made different plans for different scenarios. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would hope that this can be resolved in, uh, you know, in, in a sensible, calm way. Um, that doesn't um, that does, doesn't result in in a showdown of that nature. Um, you know, people often talk about Brexit being done. Um, like the truth is, Brexit will never be done. Uh, it, it's a fundamental change in the relationship between Britain and Ireland, and between Britain and the European Union. And just as is the case in our relations with uh, countries not in not in the European Union, but um, near neighbours like Norway, like Switzerland, like the UK, uh, we're constantly having to renegotiate and negotiate uh, arrangements. Uh, you know, the beauty of the European Union and the single market is everyone signed up to a single acquis, a single set of rules, regulations and laws. When you're outside of that but connected to it, it becomes extremely complicated. Um, like I, I couldn't count the number of treaties and agreements that exist between the EU and Switzerland uh, or between the EU and, uh, and Norway and, and, and other, uh, other near neighbours. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the relationship with Britain for the next couple of decades, that we're going to have um, ongoing agreements, ongoing treaties, issues will arise that have to be resolved. And it's best that that's done in, I think, a calm way and a sensible way and a measured way and not be escalated to um, you know, a political crisis or, 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 or uh, bring, issues, bring into play issues around nationalism. I, I just don't think how any of us will benefit, that, benefit from that in the long term. One quick last question, I'm going to throw it back to Bill. Um, you know, there, uh, when Foreign Minister Kovny was, was here just very recently, um, you know, some real concern about uh, potentially institutions in Northern Ireland collapsing. And even in the process of negotiating the protocol, we didn't have a functioning government in Stormont. You have really spent the time, as you've noted, with those uh, leaders listening. Are you concerned that the Belfast Agreement uh, is risk of, of collapsing because of the pressures uh, from the protocol? Well, you know, I, I think one thing we should never forget about, about the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Agreement, uh, is that it was um, ratified by, by the people, um, not just by political parties. It was adopted in a referendum by 97% of people in the Republic of Ireland, over 70% in Northern Ireland. Um, and, you know, I, I think political parties in the North and in the South need, need to bear that in mind. Um, this agreement belongs to the people North and South. Um, and uh, for any one political party or group of political parties to bring it down, um, uh, I think in many ways that they're going against what I believe is the settled will of people North and South. Um, and one of the real problems during Brexit, during that three-year period where we were trying to negotiate agreement with, uh, with the United Kingdom was that the institutions weren't operating. Uh, there was no assembly in Northern Ireland. There was no executive. Uh, so the politicians in Northern Ireland, instead of speaking as ministers or as a government on behalf of the general interest of Northern Ireland, uh, were speaking from a party point of view. Uh, and um, I think it would be a mistake for any party in Northern Ireland to bring down the executive or the assembly because again, once again, there's nobody actually speaking for, for Northern Ireland. So for example, if we were getting to the point where, where we were able to come to some agreement around the protocol, um, there'd be no first minister to talk to, there'd be no enterprise minister to talk to or economy minister. And I think that would be a major disadvantage to the North if, if it lost its executive and assembly. Bill. Let me turn to climate uh, for a few minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll turn to the audience. Um, the EU's proposed a CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Measure. Mm. Um, what's your government's view on that? Do you support going down that road? Um, we, 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 we do so long as it's, as long as it's a genuine uh, environmental measure. 
uh, and, and not a protectionist one. So, um, like for, for, for us, CBAM is all about carbon leakage. Uh, you know, we don't want a situation whereby we set high standards around the environment and emissions, um, which cause industries to close or wind down in Europe, uh, only for us to import those same products from other parts of the world uh, where they don't have the same environmental standards, you know, because that doesn't make sense from either perspective. It doesn't make sense from an economic perspective, but it certainly doesn't make sense from a climate perspective because it's all, it's all the one atmosphere. Uh, and if we're reducing our emissions in Europe only for um, somewhere in South America or America or China to increase their emissions, we actually lose out environmentally. So, uh, you know, we would only see that um, uh, as something we could support if it was a genuine environmental measure. So if, for example, we saw um, beef production in Ireland being reduced only to import beef from South America, that wouldn't make sense environmentally or economically. Uh, and certainly for other European countries, their big concern is around steel, uh, is that if we bring in environmental rules um, that cause steel production to be reduced in Europe only for it to be imported from elsewhere, um, that, that just doesn't, doesn't make sense. So but it would have to be a genuine um, tax that's about avoiding carbon leakage and not one that's um, a stealth tariff, if you like. You're committed to, the, the, gov the government's committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, what do you have to do to get there? Oh, well, well, a lot. <laughs> and, and, and before then, we need to, we need to get to 51% reduction by 2030. That's, that's now in law. We, we have a very ambitious uh, climate law in Ireland. Um, and we need to achieve annual reductions of about 7%. Um, and that's going to be hard to do. You know, I remember, remember saying before the pandemic that to um, achieve some of the environmental targets, everyone would have to stay at home for a year. And uh, you know, guess what we did? <laughs> and, uh, and, and emissions, uh, emissions still only went down, went down by 6 or 7%. And I think that demonstrates the extent to which our, our systems need to change. Um, you, you know, we still have uh, energy systems that are almost entirely dependent uh, on oil and gas and coal. Now, that needs to change. It needs to be renewable, interconnectivity, hydrogen. It's going to take time, uh, but we, we need to do it. Um, uh, and and also, also when it comes to, to industry, for example, um, under our, our carbon budgeting system, each sector is going to be set a target. Um, you know, agriculture, industry, buildings, you name it, that we have to meet. Um, and the one that I'd be responsible for is emissions from industry. So industry makes up about 13% of our emissions at the moment. We'll need to get them down by about half. And that's going to mean big changes, particularly for our big heavy industry to move them off oil and gas to, um, to new energy systems. But it's, um, uh, it, it, it's a change in a lot of our systems and it's going to be difficult to do. Um, I think we have to do it. Uh, the public, particularly younger people, are demanding that we do it and they're right because they're the ones who will bear the consequences of failing to take climate action. Um, but there's also big economic opportunities as well. Um, certainly Ireland as a, as a net importer of energy. Uh, we have this vision and ambition uh, that perhaps in a few decades we could become an exporter of energy rather than importing oil and gas and coal from abroad that we could use our massive wind resource uh, both to produce wind which you can then sell to the, to, to the rest of Europe uh, but turn, turn excess wind into hydrogen. Um, so if we could do that now that would be a huge economic uh, benefit for Ireland and we would then also be saying to companies that might invest in Ireland that this is the place where you go to get your sustainable energy but the the scale of change that has to happen is is, is enormous and requires huge investment but um but it's exciting too at that point let me slip in a question from the online audience because it's on on the same topic this is from Sean Finlay of Geoscience Ireland how confident are you that COP26 will be effective in in, in Glasgow in what? 26 is Glasgow, isn't it? Yeah. Top 26, yeah. Glasgow. Yes, Glasgow. Yeah, well, <laughs> to, see, to see what they decide first. Um, I, I, I'll pass on that because um, it, it hasn't happened yet. I hope it will be. Yeah. Okay. Heather, do you have one more and then we'll go to the live audience? Yeah, I, I want to talk a, a little bit about the politics of relationships. Um, and I, I found your, your comment uh, at the end of your, your remarks about reforging the transatlantic relationship. Mm -hmm feels like the transatlantic relationship has really experienced some turbulence over the last six to, to eight weeks. I mean, in some ways, starting with the mm. visa ban that was definitely um, not fully appreciated by our European uh, colleagues, uh, the Afghanistan withdrawal, 
uh, was also very difficult. Mm. And then, of course, uh, the last uh, week and a half of the announcement of the uh, US, UK, Australian mm. alliance, where you had EU Commissioner Thierry Breton talk about the need to pause and reset a very broken transatlantic relationship. You know, Ireland plays such an important role in the Irish American relationship. How would you reforge that relationship? The trade relationship feels stagnant. There's not going to be a TTIP. There's not going to be, the Biden administration has stated, you know, no major trade deals here. How do you reforge that relationship? What advice would you give the White House or uh, our colleagues in the commission to, to reforge that relationship? Yeah, that, that's that, that's that's a great question. <laughs> I, I, I think it's I think it's fair to say that some of the things that have happened in the past few weeks, um, you know, have haven't been well received in Europe. You know, there was a, a huge level of high expectation when there was a change of administration that um, EU US relations would um, w would thrive again. You know, particularly with the president who, you know, is a multilateralist um, and and and. Uh, expressed a willingness to, 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 to rebuild those relations. Um, I think when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, for some some of the European countries that, that were participating in Afghanistan, you know, they were kind of willing to stay if the US did. Um, but if the US was leaving, there was no way they could stay on their own. Um, and while I haven't spoken to her about it, I, I, I certainly get the sense that Chancellor Merkel regrets that that decision was made. And we can see the consequences of that now with the Taliban taking over so quickly. and what that's going to mean for women in particular uh, in Afghanistan, but, but others too. Um, and then obviously the, what happened with, 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 with Australia um, certainly surprised the French and they were, they, were, they were caught off guard. And I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but you, know, um, you would have hoped that they were pre-warned and pre-consulted and, and it didn't just come as a surprise. Um, uh, but I, I think the reason why we have to Reforge and re-strengthen this relationship is really for other reasons. You know, um, uh, after the Berlin Wall fell, and was one of my formative experiences as a teenager watching all those events happen. It was almost as though the march of democracy and the advancement of, of, of human rights and personal freedoms and free enterprise and free trade, and this was going to be the way it was going to be from now on. And we've seen that retreat. You know, we've seen a retreat of democracy in large parts of the world. Uh, human rights coming under uh, pressure in places where it wasn't uh, uh, as much an issue before. Uh, we see the return to protectionism. Uh, and among the things that Europe and America largely share uh, are those same values, you know, that belief in democracy, that belief in collective security, that belief in using institutions which America created, like the UN and Bretton Woods institutions, um, as means of settling disputes. Um, a belief in, in enterprise, personal freedom, free trade, and these are the values that I think most Europeans and most Americans share. Uh, and if we don't stand together in defense of them, um, other forces in the world will become stronger than us collectively. And that's why we, that's why we have to do it. Um, and there are good things happening. You know, the, the, the Trade and Technology Council is meeting in Pittsburgh in a few days. At least it's there, meeting. There was, that's a really well, good thing. there was a, a risk that it wouldn't, <laughs> and it is, and it's happening at a very high level. And, Indeed. You know, part of, the, part of the agenda there is a very strong one around trade, around um, anti-market activities engaged in by other countries and, uh, and potentially us as the US and the EU setting common standards in new areas that could then become the international standard. So ho hopefully, that'll, hopefully that, that'll go well. Hopefully the TTC is starting the path to reforge. Bill, over to you. Well, let's go to our live audience first. I've got some more questions from the online audience, so you don't have to perform, but is there anybody out there that has a question? Yes, sir. Oh, we have a microphone, microphone or uh, it's coming? Maybe. I think you have to go to the microphone. Oh, you have to go to the wall. Sorry. It's <laughs> we're over still, there. We're still le learning our routine, too. We're, getting, we're still practicing, yeah. <laughs> sure. so tell us who you are and then Grateful. ask your question. Sure, Suhail Khan with Microsoft Corporation. Grateful to CSIS and for you to be here. Uh, you graciously mentioned uh, that each country has sovereignty to institute their own tax regime. But if I can press you a little further on the effort to institute something of a cartel that would have a minimum tax, what's your posture in going forward on that effort? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I, I probably don't know much, much, much to, to add to what I, what I said earlier on that. Um, you know, you know, just to say that you know, we have always been committed to, to the OECD process, um, to both pillars, you know, one dealing with 
um, how basis calculation and the other dealing dealing with with the minimum rate. Um, um, but again, but again uh, you know, uh, as I said, as I said, said earlier, we we won't want to si sign up to something that that isn't that isn't overall in, in in our economic interests, and we will, you know, we continue to defend that principle that uh, that tax is is a sovereign issue. Um, might leave it that. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? If you think of, I'll ask one from the audience. If anybody else on the live audience has one, go over to the microphone. I'll see you and we'll call on you. Otherwise, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, hold your peace. This is from uh, <clears throat> Doug Carr of the National Review. Ireland reduced government spending substantially and saw investment growth rise. What was the most effective way to reduce spending? Good lesson for our government. We can use some advice. <clears throat> yeah, well, I, 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 but it was it, it was effective. It wasn't wasn't pleasant or desirable. Um, you, you know, we, we had to reduce uh, spending very significantly after after the global financial crisis because um, because we couldn't afford to borrow money. Um, we were part of this arrangement with the with, with the European Union and the IMF. So, you know, we had to reduce uh, the pay of government workers and public sector workers. We had to reduce welfare other than pensions. And um, we also had to increase taxes. Um, you know, none of that was was nice or desirable. It was necessary, and uh, and uh, it, it can be done. But um, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate having to do it unless unless you really have to. And unfortunately, we had to, not because we thought that it was a great, you know, that it was a great idea to do these things. We we got in a position as a country um, that um, that we lost the confidence of the bond markets and couldn't borrow and service our debt. So we had to. Have to do things that we, we, we wish to never have to do again. Another question from the audience. Hi there. Uh, my name is Garrett Downs. I'm from Inside US Trade. Uh, I was wondering, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, when he was here last week, struck a very optimistic tone that the UK would strike a free trade agreement with the United States at some point in the near future. I'm curious, uh, you know, with the fact that TTIP was not able to be reach to a conclusion, what would be the effect of Britain striking a free trade agreement with the United States on Ireland or, you know, other countries in the region? Thanks. Yeah, th thank you. Well, well look, look, principally, if, if the UK and the US can strike a trade agreement, that's, that's a matter for the, the UK and the US. It's not, 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 for, not for us to, to try to interfere in. Um, but I know that trade agreements aren't, aren't negotiated quickly, never mind ratified quickly, so I, I expect that would be uh, so, some time away if it does happen. Uh, the only thing I'd ask the U.S. to bear in mind, and I, I know from talking to your political leaders that they will do this, uh, is just to bear in mind, um, you know, you know, the impact that any U.S.-U.K. agreement could have on the situation in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, say, so for example, if um, um, uh, if 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 U.S. products were to get into Britain, and they were not compliant with the rules of the EU single market. Those potentially travelling to Northern Ireland and from there into Ireland could could be a difficulty. Uh, so, you know, the only only ask I would have is, is just to bear in mind that any agreement that um, the US may do with the UK uh, could have an impact on, on Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. But certainly, we're we're available to, to to talk and engage on that if it gets to that point. Okay, another one from the audience, actually from one of my college classmates, Eric Rasmussen. Do you see any bumps in the road regarding the near or midterm future of the euro? Um, well, actually, there's, there's always bump, bumps, bumps in the road, but, um, but uh, you know, any concerns that people may have had uh, a decade ago about the euro surviving, I think, um, I think have been answered. Um, you know, and there were like you know, people openly, genuinely speculated about um, you know countries leaving the eurozone or the eurozone failing after the global financial crisis, and, and that didn't happen. And uh, you know, I think it's I think it's very it's, it's very solid now. And you know, the, the question we talk about more uh, at a European level is how we can make the euro stronger. Um, some new countries may join in the next decade. Uh, how potentially we can um, uh, even make it compete with the dollar to become the the, the reserve currency of choice in, in the future. Bill, can I just jump in with a quick two finger on that because that that was sort of an issue even through the German election. The mm. future sort of. Was the uh, the pandemic recovery 
uh, and resilience facility, is that a one-time extravagance? Mm. Is that a euro bond in the future? Changes to the stability and growth pack? Mm. Are you go back to the rules or are you a renegotiate the rules perspective? Well, I, you know, I, I, th I think the position certainly of, of, the, of the outgoing German government has always been that that was a one-off uh, and that there shouldn't be what they describe as a, de a debt union. Um, um, it'll be interesting to see uh, if and when there's a new German government, <laughs> exactly. what, what position, what position uh, Platform, uh, yeah. um, they will take. Um, like like our, Ireland, Ireland has always been open to the idea of, of, um, of mutualization of debt, not all our debts by any means, but the European Union as a whole, barring together for European projects. Um, and that, that's kind of always made sense to me. Um, I understand the sensitivities around it for a lot of the Northern European countries in particular, um, that they don't like this idea that they would um, become responsible for other countries' other countries' deaths. But you know, if it was agreed that, a bit like what's happened if it was agreed that it was for a particular purpose, like investment in infrastructure um, or in climate, uh, and that we would all benefit from these investments, uh, then, then, then to, me, to me it's something that, that makes sense. But it would have to be, it would have to be limited and it would have to be agreed. Um, now, when the recovery fund was established, we did as we always do say it didn't set a precedent, but as we all know, um, that, that doesn't always turn out that way. But that'll be an interesting dynamic now to see, to see whether that will be a change in policy in, in, in Berlin. Exactly. But of course, if the Liberals are in the coalition, it might not. So It's going to be we'll, a we'll very see. interesting coalition platform mm. no matter what. Absolutely. Thanks, Bill. Well, we have only one left. If you okay. can give us one more minute, I think you can probably dispose of this one uh, fairly quickly. Some European pol policymakers think the Commission should be more explicit that the goal of the DSA and DMA is to save democracy. If that is that the goal, and should the Commission make that clearer? Yeah, I, I'm not, not sure. I'm clear on that question. Is, is this just the idea that that the, the tech companies this could, 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 could so bring, <laughs> bring down democracy? Um, I don't, don't, don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but um, like I, 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 I do share concerns that I think a lot of people would have is that. Uh, social media platforms have enabled um, people to find each other who otherwise wouldn't in the past, and otherwise, and have, have allowed for the growth of, um, you know, of conspiracy theories and, and fake news and so on. Um, but whether the DMA and DSA are going to be sufficient instruments to solve that problem, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think that's what they're about. Well, that was a helpful note to end on. I think, Heather, do. You any comment, closing comment before we say goodbye? No, with, with, again, just with, with gratitude, uh, you really gave us a great tour de force of both the, the, the human, the interaction between our countries and the value of that, of our, our, our business communities, getting our econ, economic engines back revving again, but also the importance and the fragility of, of peace and not underestimating that. So just with extraordinary gratitude that uh, you were sort of bringing us back to life with your visit here and back to the in-person conversation. Uh, it's, been, it's been great, thank you so much. My, my pleasure. And yes, it's been a great pleasure. It's an honor to have you here and uh, we hope we'll have you back, either as Tanasht or uh, Tishok in the future. <laughs> yeah, either be, one. You're welcome I, in both. I'd be, I'd be delighted to come back as a pri private citizen or in any capacity. Uh, well, that, <laughs> that, that too, but the audience won't be as big if you come back <laughs> as a private citizen. So thank you very much.